All right. Good evening. I was waiting for the clock to inch to 6.30. That's okay. It is 6.29 p.m. on September 27th. Um, so we'll officially call this regular uh, meeting of the board of directors to order. Um, and we'll begin with our live Zoom. I believe it's to the front of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. So, a super quick roll call. Um, and we'll start at this end of the table. Um, just again, um, want to kind of start to practice um, recognizing friends. Uh, I'm Senate, I'm from Chicago, 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 <laughs> District 2 in Wenatchee. <laughs> Thank you so much. Glad you are joining us uh, virtually this evening, Dan. Um, and welcome to all of our guests. Of course, we have Dr. Hunter with us as well. Um, uh, as a reminder, if you are here in person, uh, make sure that you please resign in um, so that we can have your meeting here. Um, so, um, Director Morris, uh, we're going to have you to our, for our welcome. <laughs> Is that okay to mind? Oh, no, I don't mind at all. I just haven't found it yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. Thank you so much. Um, our agreements are to stay engaged, experience discomfort, and be vulnerable, speak the truth, and expect and accept non closure. Just a second, I'm getting that land acknowledgement pulled up. We in the Tacola School District acknowledge that the land where we teach, collaborate, learn, and play is a traditional land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish and Muckleshoot people, past and present, and honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish and Muckleshoot tribes. As a public school district, we have the responsibility for the stewardship of this land. And we recognize the Duwamish and Muckleshoot people who have been living and working here since time immemorial. Thank you, Dr. Um, all right, so we will move to approval of this evening's agenda. So moved. Second. Second. Um, all right. Um, Eddie, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, it is approved. So we'll move to our first um, opportunity for public comment this evening. So, as always, there are several ways that you can uh, uh, give a public comment. Um, you can do it in person. There's a sign up sheet in the back there um, if you would like to do so. Um, or if you are running us virtually this evening and would like to offer public comment, you can raise your hand or type your name in the chat. So just a second. Okay. So it doesn't look like we have anyone uh, for public comments. Um, so just as a reminder, you will have another opportunity at the end. Um, uh, yeah, if something comes up in the meeting and some discussion that you want to offer some, some comments or some insight around, um, we definitely welcome that at the end of our, our time today. Um, so we'll move us into our reports. Um, this is a report-heavy evening. Um, so we'll get us started with our student representative report. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I started when we started, and I'm on. 
Something about the representative, I was like, I was looking into maybe finding a junior representative for the next year, mm -hmm. one example this time. So, and I was, I didn't ask anyone specifically yet, but some students, this one person like came up to me and they like, hey, are you Mr. Representative? How do you get involved in that? So, you know, I feel like it's pretty good that some people are interested in here. I guess we could think of it talking about it. So <laughs> it's working for us. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, okay, I can jump in. Um, so just a few kind of big things to report. I, um, as you all know, at our last meeting, we approved the, the task force for uh, safety and inclusion. So um, I brought together a small group of folks that will, are gonna help with the selection committee, or be the selection committee uh, to, um, to fill that committee or that task force. Um, so uh, the communication on that has been just a tiny bit slow, and that is totally um, my delay. Um, so, uh, but expect that something will be coming very soon um, with some details about how to get involved, how to apply to be a part of that task force um, uh, in your email inboxes in the next few days. Um, and so really excited about that work going forward, particularly it's, it's really timely, I think, in, um, you know, one of the reports that we're looking at um, today, even around um, sexual harassment and reporting, um, and in reviewing that, it just became, I think, even more, um, just became more aware of the need, I think, for the work the task force is going to do, so I'm really excited about that. Um, uh, I had the opportunity to spend some time working um, really thinking about how we're doing our work as a board. So starting that conversation today, we're thinking about um, board presentations and um, just our whole process of, of uh, how those presentations come about and what are in those presentations. I uh, had the opportunity to meet with Dr. Borishay and Dr. Herman, um, and then excited to, to really kind of bring that conversation to full board tonight, just to really make sure that we are um, really being responsive in our work, um, uh, being the most effective that we can be, um, and also really um, collaborative. That's what I'm really hoping to do, is just increase the way that we're collaborating with each other um, and, and doing it in a really, again, responsive and um, relational way. Um, I also had the opportunity of actually just this afternoon to speak with um, Adam Kay from the PSESC ESD, um, around a really incredible opportunity for us to continue some work that we've been doing um, with the um, other roadmap uh, to, with other districts around us in the Romac region that's really focused on um, elevating youth voice of color, um, uh, youth of color's voice of, in and leadership. Um, so I'm really excited to hopefully partner with our student rep and to talk to them as well in the next few days um, and um, Dr. Bori Shade and um, some, uh, some other folks at uh, Showalter um, to just really increase how we are creating more opportunities um, in our district, sustainable opportunities to really create leadership opportunities throughout our districts. So I'm really, really excited about um, the possibility and the potential for that. Um, I think those are the big things um, for the superintendent's report, um, oh, I skipped that, didn't I? Yeah. I'm sorry. Right. I, thought so we just gonna go down the, I thought we were just going to go down the line. <laughs> with that. Um, so during the superintendent's report, uh, a couple of things to highlight. One, um, last week we finished up the open houses, which were just spectacular. Uh, the, each of the schools had an open house. Turnout was really good. Lots of parents, um, students, staff. It was just really good opportunity on the last few years. So um, we had an opportunity to talk about and highlight a bit of our strategic plan. We have more of that coming up in the future opportunities. So there'll be more communication out about that. But um, it was just good to see everybody. And, and I think a lot of the parents and students were excited to be back in person, to be able to see their uh, teachers. For some people, you know, it, it had been a little while. So. Um, those were really positive. Also uh, had a couple of opportunities um, to get some communication back about the superintendent student advisory committee that I'm starting. 
And we have a couple of students that are interested in connecting with them hopefully this week. And um, actually through some of the uh, open house opportunities, um, heard from a couple of other students who might have interest. So um, I'm just trying to follow up with those students and then we'll get started with that. And hopefully we'll continue to get good buzz about that and have other students uh, be able to join, which I'm excited about and how we can tie that into the middle school and elementary opportunity. Um, and then the last one I'll talk about for tonight is just we've been working on um, the SRO process that we've talked about for a while that's been going on for um, some time. We had what was called the um, uh, community collabor collaboration. Uh, so it, was a, it was like a group that we had when we invited um, students, parents, staff, and um, we were able to talk through a lot of those pieces. The students, I have to say, had probably the best attendance. I think they were at every single one of those, provided absolutely outstanding feedback, um, really good insight to talk about kind of what they were looking for, or what they would want to see. So we're going to continue through that process. I should have a more comprehensive update um, by the next board meeting. So that's full time. I also attended some open houses. It was very fun to see the parents and the students thriving. <laughs> and I had the great opportunity of volunteering in a classroom today, finally getting back into those classrooms. And it just happened to be a second grade, so I was especially enthusiastic about it. So that was that was good. And I'd like to be able to do more of that. So, so a couple of couple of things. So um, we had the first, uh, or I guess, introductory uh, meeting of the parent advisory group, which um, parent advisory group, I think, has been going for a while at least, but this was about a uh, parent advisory group meeting the um, administrators and a couple of us board members um, were there. And um, it was, I thought it was um, really good because it, you know, brought up a lot of, we kind of touched on a lot of issues. It was, this is just kind of an introductory, let's listen and hear what's, what some of the parents are thinking and so forth. And a lot of the issues, I mean, I, I don't think there's new issues, but what it does is it kind of helps uh, prioritize things in terms of if you get, you know, enough uh, parents and students and so forth thinking something is important and kind of should raise it up on the priority list. And of course it started with, um, what they call transparency, which you know rapidly goes to communications, which obviously we've been working on for quite a number of time, quite a while. Um, you know, they were talking some of the same things we talk about: uh, interpreters, mailings. Um, you know, so that's actually I spent a fair amount of time afterwards talking to one of the members, and she was particularly interested in the communication issues. So. Um, Hopefully, I suggested that she get in contact with Carrie Martin and kind of, you know, uh, as we think about how to kind of roll out some kind of communication plan that's going to serve all the different uh, groups that we need to communicate with, it would be helpful, obviously, to have their um, their input on that. So that was one of the issues. Another one that came up was was iReady. Uh, this is one <laughs> that we hear about quite a bit. Um, I think, um, and this one also, I think, in my mind, kind of goes down to communications. Um, there's a lot of students that don't understand why, <laughs> and Dr. Gorshade actually spent some time kind of trying to, top of her head, throw out what was, you know, why we do that and what it's about. And, you know, it's one of the parents brought up the issue of um, students that just kind of fly through, just as she says, they say, boom, 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 boom. And, you know, um, there's kind of a myth, you know, he kind of mentioned, well, he thinks 50% of the students do that. Well, we actually know how many, <laughs> what percent of the students do that, because I asked that at one of the board meetings, like, I think for the reading, it was like 10% and math, it's like 6%. six percent. So, but for me, that's that's really an interesting issue because what it, it, it kind of raises a flag and said, well, if student, a student does that, that means they're disconnected from their learning process. You know, they, they aren't, they don't feel this. And so, then, you know, then we should have a whole process to go, all right, figure out, get in touch with the student, what's going on, blah, 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 blah. So anyway, there's, that brought up the whole issue of, you know, um, and I think maybe we have a start on this um, 
yeah, preparing students yeah, on tonight's board meeting is how we communicate that effectively and how students come to understand what it's about and that it's where they're going to be and so forth. So, so that was interesting. I think we're on that one. Um, another issue that comes up a lot, recess, you know, not enough, um, not handled right. You know, there's a whole whole set of things you could talk about there. Uh, another one was um, hiring, you know, some students, some parents said they wanted to be, you know, part of uh, the hiring process for teachers. Sounds like an interesting idea worth looking at. Um, another issue that came up was uh, curriculum. And that's one I'm gonna spend a little time talking about, particularly, the citing was the reading curriculum, which uh, doesn't seem to be working very well for our students. Um, there's been a lot of literature written about that one, and you know that's one we need to examine and and um, take apart. Uh, some people mentioned high cap. That's another one we talked about last time. A lot of issues around how we do that, how you do it well. It's not that easy. Um, anyway, so I just wanted to uh, shout out to um, Mary and Abdo and Julie Hurd, who, who are the staff people advising the put pull that group together because I think that's going to be a really valuable group as we move forward. So um, the other one I wanted to just briefly comment was so um, the roadmap project, which is the South King County Districts, um, uh, that project uh, published some data on. Um, uh, career and talk, career and technical um, so college, yeah, college of technical college. Career, in, what's that? CTC. What's that sample? CTC. Career and technical. Career college. and technical college. Okay, yeah. it's basically the community colleges. Although some of them used to be like two years now, some of them actually four year degrees and so forth. But anyway, it was um, comparing other the districts in the South End. And, and a couple of ways, uh, the percentage of students that are actually enrolling in college. And as it turns out, um, uh, and this is graduation year 2019, we actually had the highest uh, percentage of um, students, like 60% that were had, you know, graduated from high school and then enrolled in uh, one of the career and technical colleges, which um, that's a shout out to our career and uh, college and career staff of at Foster because they work their best out and it shows we came in number one in all the districts in um, South King County. And then the other thing they looked at was, and this is a little farther down the road, but um, uh, let's see. Oh yeah, I was also going to point out that's for the a group as a whole, but in terms of black students, we were also number one. So that's a good, in terms of all the other districts in King County at the highest college enrollment. And then uh, a little farther down the line, the other thing they looked at is outcomes. That is, did they graduate something to get them you know, in there? It's another thing to get them graduated. And um, it turns out for black students, we had the highest graduation. So that's uh, or the highest percentage of students that actually completed uh, a degree uh, within three years, I think. So that's another one. That's a shout out to the staff at Foster in terms of pre preparing them to the point where they can actually succeed in college, which is an important indicator as well. So anyway, a couple of um, good uh, successes for us. Director Bolichak. Thank you. Um, just <clears throat> a few things. I also attended a lot of the, well, all the open houses and um, the PTO meeting at Cascade View. And uh, my, <clears throat> I was very impressed with the, um, with the turnout for those. Uh, I loved walking around and talking to the teachers about how excited they are about the year as it unfolds. Um, my a concern is the language access. I know at one of the meetings, at least 60% of the people had no access to what was being spoken. And um, <clears throat> that's really difficult. We, we just have to figure out a, a better way um, to handle that. Um, also uh, went to a tennis match, went to a couple of football games, haven't made it to volleyball yet, but I'm looking forward to it. And uh, golf, uh, our, our teams and our coaches are working hard right now. Um, uh, the parent advisory meeting, um, I was there, um, as a board, we need to figure out whether we want to do this on a rotating thing or whether we want to make it an actual meeting because, um, are, are we going to have two of us there? Or are we going to make it so that all of us can be here? So, 
I don't know, <clears throat> Carly, if that's something you want to look at or or how we want to handle that. But um, I also uh, have started up tutoring at in my building. Um, right now, it's me and four very excited, active students um, eager to learn. Um, so I'm looking for more support of anyone who wants to come in either as a student to learn or as a tutor to help. Um, and then the, the last thing I wanted to mention was that um, the football team has been coming to the pantry to uh, volunteer on Saturdays, which is a really great thing. They have a great time and the coaches have really been affirming that. The, the other two things that um, I think are interesting is that race back, race back um, sends six students every Friday. On Fridays, they take a, por a portion of their day and they are out in the field. These are juniors and seniors and they're, uh, they go to different internships around the community to learn about businesses or whatever. So these six kids are gonna be at the pantry every Friday um, learning about the operation there. And I just think that's a great experience to get them out of school, uh, out of the school building and experience um, business, community, all of that. Uh, so I would just put that out there as something we might wanna to aspire to. And um, also that the mayor's interns are coming uh, to the resource center tomorrow. And I'm, I'm not sure if those are college or high school students, but um, that's another place that um, people can get some real world experience of uh, how you run a little business, how you help your neighbors, your community, and uh, what's going on in Tukwila. So let's see. I think that's all I have on my list. Um, thank you. Well, thank you so much, Director Volchek. So to kind of get us back you know, on the actual order of the agenda, sorry about that. Um, I love that. Sam I is that, here too. Sam yeah, is I here. just saw that Sam is here, oh. so I'd love to hear from Sam um, if you have anything to report, um, Sam, and then we'll jump to the COVID-19 report after Sam. Okay, Um. yeah, I just have a few things to report on. One is school starting, I guess. Oh. I don't know if that was intentional, but we lost your- Oh, sorry. So, yeah, what, could you guys hear me? Yes, now we can. Okay, yeah. Um. So I think the transition to school starting has been really smooth, like sports starting up again, as well as we had a we had an open house, which I think was successful as well. Many people came. And I also, and what's happening in school right now, Um. right now it's home, um, Homecoming, we have our first homecoming since 2019, which is exciting. And that'll be taking place October 8th. Yeah, no, yeah, October 8th from 8 to 11. And next week on Monday, I believe we have a multicultural assembly happening at Foster. And yeah, we also have like hallway competitions as well as class competitions within our school to like pump up everybody's spirit before homecoming and next week's also our homecoming game. And yeah, um, I actually had a few questions as well. I was wondering um, what is the strategic plans? Because I think one of the people the board hired came in our class and talked about it, but I, I wanted more information on what is that and like what are like the steps with that? in place and um, yeah i think that's my main question thank you thank you so much i wonder if uh i definitely want to answer that question i think it's relevant is that is that okay um if you kind of like revert back to superintendent report for sure, a second. sure. Um, so we, we talked a little bit about that in the beginning, uh, but we'll be reaching back out to people to have opportunities to follow up about the strategic plan. So with students and uh, parents and community and staff that we have. So the during the open houses, that was to raise some awareness that we have there. And then this, the strategic plan is really trying to focus in on the areas that as a school district, we're trying to um, Kind of channel our resources to and make some changes over the next four years. 
And I believe there's now information on the website, right? About both the strategic plan um, and everything is still in draft form. Um, the strategic plan as well as the SMART goals that we're in the process of gathering and put around. Um, so I'll try and find that um, direct page and then add it in there. Great. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Sam. Um, so we'll now jump to mm -hmm. the back to the COVID-19 reports. <laughs> Hi, um, am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Hello. Um, so uh, our cases have been steadily low in numbers. I've been noticing there's been um, a bit more staff in, in ratio compared to uh, the student cases that we've been seeing. Uh, the vaccination clinic, um, there's an, another one coming up on October 13th, and um, myself and Aaron are working with a uh, King County Public Health to make improvements to the events. Like, uh, for example, for now, uh, we're serving the vaccines to those who are 18 and younger, and we're trying to get it so that we'll be able to make vaccines available to families and also hopefully staff eventually. And then uh, finally, Governor Inslee's emergency proclama proclamation is ending um, in on October 31st. And so in November, we'll still expect all protocols in regards to case reporting and um, exposure notifications to our, our families and staff um, to remain. But the thing that will end is the vaccine requirements for staff, volunteers, and indoor contractors coming onto campus. So uh, that's something for the uh, COVID response team to kind of um, go over and, and determine what we want to do um, about that. And that's about it. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Meister. Uh, I think I know the answer to this already, but just curious, <laughs> the, the, the folks that we have had supporting us through COVID, Ms. Meister being one of them, all those folks are going to stay <laughs> up as a part of the team, at least through the school year, or are we anticipating that like as as restrictions get, I mean, if the proclamation gets lifted, that we might not need those supports anymore? I think the plan was to have that in place. And then I think as we dialogue with the teams to figure out okay. what we do moving forward, I think we have a budget to have those people throughout the year, but their responsibilities may change a little bit. So, but we, we do plan to have that in place. Conversations for sure as we kind of get to that and of the emergency proclamation that they can figure out what our next steps are going to be. You know, I think this is, you know, just will be a, is an important transition to make sure that we're communicating really well, right, about what's happening, why, and what shifts might look like. Um, yeah, and we've got, because we do have a month um, before that changes, um, we have the opportunity to really have some intentional conversations with folks about that. And, Moving to a new stage of pandemic. <laughs> okay, um, thank you all. And uh, any other questions, comments, stuff? Uh, um, all right, um, so we'll move now to the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Okay. Okay, all the seconds. <laughs> um, all right, all in favor of approving the consent agenda? Aye. 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 Possible that Jan's thumb is up, but I can't see Jan. So, um, okay, great. Also, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Um, okay, um, so we're going to move to the board discussion. There are two items one is board presentations, and then uh, the laws that you know the discussion. Um, so the board presentations, I know Dr. Herman sent over um, just some notes, um, these are really basic notes from a meeting um, that, that we had, um, it's really our first connection point about what, um, you know, how we want to see presentations evolve, and just the process for presentations, the process for questions, um, just kind of the opportunity for us to really think about leading up to the agendas and how, how we're really, really doing this. So kind of what we were thinking about and the way that this is broken down and Again, these just are our three brains, which is why we wanted, you know, of course, it's important to bring it to everyone to get our collective thoughts. So we're thinking about like the essential items um, kind of being like foundational to every presentation that comes to us. Like what are the things, kind of the high level things that, you know, no matter what the topic of the presentation, these are the big pieces that we want to know. 
or have some some information around. Um, so I definitely want to have have some brainstorming around what what's missing from this list. There certainly know there probably is. Um, um, and then we had some written discussion about typically. So I guess maybe just kind of start at the top of the list um, and start with essential items and um, kind of what what you think might be useful to add or if you have any questions about what's already here. So um, for me, the the race and equity toolkit. Mm -hmm. I mean that. It, it isn't necessarily part of every single presentation, but I suspect it will be for a lot of them. I mean, you have to kind of look at it and see what, you know, but to me, that's, um, you know, I was on a presentation or I was listening to somebody up in Bellevue talk about how they're doing their version of the equity. And they they have a just a little one sheet questionnaire, which would in our case would correspond to the rubric questions, for example and say, you know, you just have to fill these out, you know, if it's if it's relevant I mean, to the to the presentation. So that's I guess that's the one the one thing um, that I'll probably add to that. And, and I guess like what how would how would we determine or I guess the, the team, right? The, the determine like when that one page or when that would be applicable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't. I think it's going to be more often than not. Yeah, I would think so. Yeah. 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 So yeah. the the pieces typically, as we've talked about in the past, like there will be times where uh, part of using the race and equity toolkit is that there's not always necessarily a solution. It's elevating mm -hmm. kind of the challenges that may be associated. So let's say we're doing something that's a compliance issue with the state or the federal. Uh, a federal report and in using uh, the race and equity tool that we noticed that it has some challenges with our creative community that might not align with what we might think we would want to do. So that then calls out just some of the challenges that it's like, there's not much we can do about this, but we're elevating so that people know we are also aware of it. There are some things that you can like have conversations with legislators to see if you can change language. But um, that's usually what it is. It's, it doesn't always necessarily present a solution. It just also raise, elevates or raises um, some of the challenges that may be associated with whatever the topic may be. So those are some situations where I could see that that might be that, but. Um, Ideally, yes, just seeing how this, I, I would think almost all of them in some way, shape, or form would be one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, one way to approach it is to say if if you don't think it does, then why question one is right. just, oh, why not? <laughs> yeah, why not? Yeah. Why don't you? Yeah. And then, yeah. you know, go from there. Yeah. So mm -hmm. there would be at least a, you know, we thought about race and equity on every one of these topics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree. Director Bullard Jack. I'm wondering if uh, language supports would be something that we would want to put in that essentials list, always asking what language supports will be necessary. Um, yeah, so that it's inclusive for everyone. And obviously I know some people need additional time to process all these pieces. So tonight, obviously, it's not the only time we can have this. So any additional feedback or people are thinking about things, you know, more than happy to receive that input too. Yeah, Dr. Bullard, Dr. you said that, I just kind of made me think about like, you know, communication, I think is, is such a critical uh, thing that we, we talk, we've been talking about and we know that we need to improve on, we've improved already and we want to see that continue. So I, I wonder, you know, I think kind of as a part of that, like language supports that are in place or that are needed. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think it kind of goes into some like the timeline or, um, but yeah, I think just what the, for lack of a better word, communication, process or plan, but something about like, how are we going to ensure, and this all kind of, this is the risk that we took it, how are we going to ensure that mm -hmm. we're getting the information out to the right people in the right language, all of those different things. Mm 
Um, so one of the things that I guess we kind of talked about, this is my own uh, opinion, but I'm, but I'm open to y'all, is that like the template of like how it looks doesn't necessarily need to be the same. I think that it's interesting to see the unique flair that comes from the individual reports. I think what's more important to me is like the content that's in the report, but I also can see that there's value in like, you know, having a report, I can't find one, you know, that like has some structure to it, right? And so it can kind of can be ease of reading and things like that. So kind of what are y'all's thoughts about even just the way the presentations look or how the information is presented? Yeah, the other thing I was thinking about that one is, um, and this probably has to do with data analysis is, and it also kind of has an impact on school improvement plans. If we're looking at data, you know, and hopefully when we get a start, uh, smart some smart goals with strategic plan, we need to be looking at the same data over time, you mm -hmm. know, because if you present, you know, a topic and then look at one set of data and then the next time another set of data and the next time another set of data, we can't, the problem is we can't, um, see how we're doing <laughs> how we're progressing over time so there needs to i mean it doesn't mean you can never introduce new forms of data but i think you know once particularly once we get smart goals we should have some continuity <clears throat> so we can see you know we say we're doing this because it's going to have an impact so what's the impact what's the measure and are we actually seeing that impact that's kind of the um the question and it's yes yeah, it's, it's probably particularly relevant for school improvement plans, but even, yeah, I don't know, for for the district smart goals as well. Any kind of smart goals, we need to make sure that we're seeing them each time. Yeah, the exact format of the template, you know, I agree with you. It's, if it looks kind of similar, that's good, but it can, it can vary a little bit. Okay. Um, so another thing we kind of reflected on is, um, you know, really thinking about, you know, when a presentation is a questions only presentation versus a presentation where, you know, we can engage in a little bit more of a conversation. Um, you know, I, I think, again, it, you know, I mean, we all have very different styles of how we process and, and take information. Um, I struggle with like, with reading all of this and really being able to, like questions come for me as I'm talking about something or hearing. Um, and so, you know, I think there, there is value in particularly some of the things that we're getting right now with question building presentations to inter have, like infuse some element of, you know, interaction. Um, so kind of what we had talked about is, you know, um, uh, we have agenda setting meetings and, and kind of at those meetings, we're talking about and making a decision about like based on the item, you know, what might be the best presentation mode. Um, so I guess kind of the, the biggest question around this is, are there particular types of presentations that you think would be best done kind of more in a live uh, setting? Also keeping in mind that we're we're really we really want to be more strategic about how we're using the work sessions to really like get into the nitty gritty of things so that the board regular meetings can kind of say a little bit more high level, right? I know that we want to be in like like uh, I want to understand like the the you know to some degree the weeds of things, um, but you know and so I think balancing that so keeping work sessions as a way to like really dig into those and then leading into the items that are on the, the board agenda. I would say if it if it's something new to us, it should probably go on the live agenda. If it's a report that we've had before and is an update, then it makes sense to keep it just as a report. Yeah, I can tell you going back um, why we started the kind of questions only presentation is that we were having uh, presentations that people would come in and basically just read to us <laughs> in the PowerPoint, yep. which <laughs> we talked about. And, <laughs> and, and, you know, I mean, we can all read. We all <laughs> so the question is, yeah, to, yeah, I mean, but at the same time, we want the, you know, the discussion about, you know, the, the meat of the, of the item. So that was really the reason that we went to the present. Uh, you know, questions only presentation or try and shorten down because we used to go to like 10 or 11 items. <laughs> it's not that just exhaust everybody. So, but anything that that will help 
you know, that we can absorb and then also have the meaningful discussion. That's what we want. Yeah. Yeah, and kind of what we talk about too is there might be some where it's kind of like a mix, like sure. a data report. Sure. Like, right? We get the data report ahead of time. We can still ask our questions, but then there's like the the, the component of what this really looks like. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, right. it's, it's kind of more of that um, that interactive. Um, what does this mean for us? Um, and then just kind of the last thing is you know, we've got that the board tracking sheet um, that we are we've been really utilizing I think and, and starting to utilize in a good way I know it's been really helpful for me as I'm meeting with Dr. Herndon and um, about things about things to put on the agenda it's really kind of help keep keep, keep some of that in line and I think we can also use that as a way to help really kind of keep like you know there's a topic what are the really big questions that we want to know. Um, not that the questions that are in there are going to be the only things that we want or expect or anticipate um, in, you know, in, in a presentation, but, you know, at least I think I just want to get as much as we can our intentions of what we hope for uh, out so that, you know, so that it, it just, again, becomes more of a um, process of transparency and, you know, just really making sure that we're helping everybody do their work better. Well, and maybe including the rationale for yeah. decision making. Yeah. Sometimes that rationale for those decisions given to staff makes a huge difference. Mm. I'm going to add that to the essential items. Okay. And then the other, the other last kind of last component is that Dr. Henry and I have talked about is, you know, we really want to make sure that we're setting everybody up for success in, in this space. And so like if something's not ready, um, we can pull it from the agenda and we can say, hey, here's again the things that we need. Um, and then we'll try it again next time. Um, yeah, what kind of what are y'all's thoughts around that? Um, and that would be like a like a Monday morning type. Yeah. Type that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Okay. The only other thing I was thinking on this whole thing, it, it'd be as this should probably be part of um, ultimately the operating agreement. Okay. Because yeah. otherwise, what happens sometimes we start developing these these little uh, projects, and then all of a sudden we have about five different things. That we, <laughs> so if we can incorporate them into the operating agreement, you know, when we can find, kind of finalize that would be helpful because then we have one place to go. Yes. <clears throat> Great. So I think with this, we'll pro I'll probably follow up again with Dr. Borges and Dr. Herndon, and then um, kind of follow back up with the board um, with, with kind of what we fleshed out a little bit more. And um, and of course, as everything it can evolve and change um, as we try it out. And it. All right, Dr. Larson. So this may be really quick. So my intention, so the the General Assembly of the Ocean State School Directors is going to be meeting on this Friday and Saturday to go through all this this big book of all the different positions. And um, what, as I said last time, um, my intention is is basically if you go through each of the positions, you'll see a, a pass or do not pass, which is a recommendation of the committee, either the Legislative Committee for Legislative Positions or the Resolutions Committee for the Permanent Positions. And my intention is basically to vote their recommendations. There's a couple, sometimes, uh, you know, there is some interesting discussions and I will change my mind based on what I hear the discussion is, but for the most part, that's my intent. So the purpose of this little session here was just to, if anybody had any particular items that they wanted to, you know, have a, you know, talk about and, you know, we could talk about a vote on or whatever, then we can do that. Otherwise, I'll just, you know, turn it through. Like I say, it's a, it's kind of like a 10 hour marathon, but <laughs> virtual and anybody who, you know, you can come in anytime during that, that period, you can log in and see what's going on. There's only one person that has the voting. I'll have the voting ones. If, you know, if there's something that you wanted to say to the group, then we could exchange voting privileges that can be done. So anyway, the purpose of this one was just to see if there's any ones that people wanted to talk about at all. And then next time I'll come back with a list of um, the, the next exercise is to prioritize the top 10. 
And I'll come back with my recommended list of top 10 and then we can review that. And we have, I think, the next board meeting is on the 11th and we have to get that back to them by the 12th, which is fine. So it gives us a day to, you know, anyway. So that's the intention. So if there's any, any if anybody actually went through, <laughs> it's a monstrous book, but if there's no discussion, we can. And I did not go through that. Whole yeah, thing. yeah, um, no. And that's why I gave the spreadsheet, which was kind of the yeah, high level. Yeah. You know, it's kind of scan. Oh, yeah, I'm interested in this one. And then go look up the details. That's yes. kind of, but if it all looks um, fine and you trust me to do it, then we trust you. Just as long as you get sped in. Right? Yeah, right. <laughs> but, and we can, and like I say, we'll talk about the priorities next time. So. Okay. Thank you so much for. Spending your two days uh, doing that this week. Um, okay, so now to our questions only presentations. And just kind of get, go down the list. Um, any additional questions on the financial forecast? Yeah, I guess the, the question that I have on that one is um, so, I mean, we, we seem to frequently go this through this process at the end of the year of. You know, I mean, there's a fairly significant move in the fund balance, you know, 6.7 to 4.9. And I mean, I've asked this question for years and I'm just trying to kind of maybe ask it again is my understanding is the reason we have this big shift at the end of the year is that's when you kind of true up the books essentially. Yep. And so, um, and, you know, it would, I think I've asked this question before, you know, in order to avoid this kind of large swing, could we true up the books quarterly or monthly? And I think the answer to that was, well, Skyward doesn't really work that way. I don't know. What's your perspective I mean, on that? You potentially could, but some things happen in August that we're, we don't necessarily know, okay. right? Like we know that for sure that there'll be um, extra hours or additional hours, but the difference between um, that is if they can be charged for categorical, which we can, um, uh, you know, get reimbursed by the state versus actually hitting just BA dollars or um, or the money that we get from, you know, like our um, enrichment. Oh, yeah, okay. So that's usually where the, the, the major shift shift happens. But um, one thing to realize, I mean, yes, we went from six point something percent to 4.9 is that the net is $890,000. I know that's yeah. still high, yeah. but that speaks to how much we received and recouped with our um, Categorical. federal capital yeah. dollars yeah. that we were reimbursed for. So I just kind of, is there any you know, system changes that we could do to, or that could be done to, you know, get that 890000 down to a smaller number? I mean, you said it's kind of, you don't know till August, there's somewhere some hours go right so what happens is is that for the month of month of august yeah. and then the month of september and then the first week of october yeah. we're still accruing back and some of those items that we are accruing back are um are encumbered right so they're already accounted for and then there's some things that may not have necessarily been accounted for so between that number yeah. and I would say the first week of October, I don't see a huge shift yeah, right. there. Right. Um, but that is more accurate. And and why does that do? I mean, why do we not know about that stuff earlier? Uh, I'm just trying. I to would just say that just there's a lot of professional development that happens that's not necessarily um, captured and or covered. So it would okay. be more of maybe looking at. Um, historical trends it yeah. may be inflating right yeah, yeah, sure. of what we potentially okay. hope to expect okay. but i don't want to over inflate but yeah, obviously sure. you know you just don't want to go either way over Too much, yeah. either way right, right, right. um okay so I, yeah, just, so I will make sure to yeah i mean yeah that hopefully that's that that could very i could see that being something as you kind of experience more years you kind of get a feel for where, where things go okay but yeah, because we are, I mean, obviously we were on track to hit our 6% and then now we're off. So anyway, okay, thanks. And just to clarify for, for other people who are tracking, school districts end their fiscal year August 31st. So most people think of a calendar year, but in the school systems, we end August 31st and then 
the process of record selling the books and where things are. That's what Ms. Birdsock and her team do for pretty much September going into October to make sure it's all that. Yeah, and I'm always just kind of, I'm in an accountant, so it'd be really nice to kind of spread that out. So, because I know you guys get consumed with that function in kind of September, October, November. And I don't know if it's if there's any way to smooth that out over the year. Maybe, I mean, like you're saying, if, if a lot of the PD takes place in, the, in August, which I guess it does, yeah, because that's summer, then I don't know, maybe, yeah. <laughs> I won't, I won't it's just a matter of uh, right. <laughs> taking a guess. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, okay, um, if there are no other questions on that one, you can know what questions you have on the redistricting update. So, yeah, I mean, this, this looks, looks good to me. I guess the only thing that I was, um, you know, and whether we think about this, I guess, whether well, this would be for a future, which I guess we could change. I mean, we do have the option to go to at least, I think the law says two at large. Maximum. So we could do one at large mm -hmm. or something, and which might have some advantages. Obviously, we can't do it for this particular one because we need to, it needs to go through a load of people, but um, we should probably have that discussion. Yes. To see if we want to do that, and then and then start up whatever process we need to do to get that going. If if that's a good way to do it, I, I agree. I think that yes, one hundred percent. Um, so thinking about that, like being a valid measure or a part that we want to do. I don't have any idea. Like, what does it matter what year? Uh, you can, no, you can do it kind of whenever there are four times of the year where school leadership can go out for an hour. So February. April, August, and November. Um, but when you go out for a measure, like we typically do, uh, on most many school districts do their bonds and levies in February. That's the ideal time. Um, so usually ballot measures come out there because it depends on where your position is placed on the ballot. So February is a less crowded time. Um, and passage of measures depend on number of turnouts and historical turnouts in the last one so november can be a really crowded ballot so sometimes school things can be you know on page two or three or four depending on how big the ballot is mm -hmm. and then april is typically when school districts might go out again if they weren't able to pass something in um, so it kind of depends but for this one that yeah, we could totally explore which area might look best because this would not be a Fiscal ballot measure. This is more of a kind of reorganization. And this is one we clearly want to get input from the community on, mm -hmm. um, which be a little tricky because I'm not sure most people. <laughs> you have to do a fair amount of communication to get people to understand what this is. Mm -hmm. um, so, but you know, we definitely want to hear from people and and make sure they understand what the the pros and cons of doing keeping it the way it is versus. Having one at large, you know, mm -hmm. or whatever. So, but I don't know. We it's figure we don't seem to be <laughs> like finding people from the third district. Well, we'll so far, out. although yeah, <laughs> that hasn't it's... been historically. We you know it hasn't been an issue, but you know why does this time? And interesting. I mean, interesting to hear this new potential. Um, we don't think it actually opens up a whole other neighborhood. For sure, um, and then extend it by a few. Yeah, I mean, our, our existing districts, I mean, District One is <laughs> is long, stringy, <laughs> which is a little interesting, but anyway. <laughs> so, I guess when, when would even be the best time to just even start talking about that? I know there might be some other considerations too, but yeah, I would look at just kind of the whole landscape of what we're thinking about. And then obviously we have to go through this process. Either way, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah for, so sure. for sure. I would say spring is the early next um, to start to engage in a conversation. So we will look into maybe having that lunch. Yeah, yeah, and that'll be starting. Yeah, starting the conversation next year at some point. Um, so, because yeah, we were on a deadline for this, and again, we wouldn't 
they would be nowhere to be able to balance the third dimension. So um, this is like the path, the immediate path forward with intention to really think about what it could look like later on. Okay. Um, any other additional questions on the accreditation update? Yeah, did I read somewhere that the high school is accredited at this point until the 24? Right. And is that announced to the, is that communicated to the community? Um, we will be talking about that because we've got a time frame about doing the accreditation process. So, yeah, I mean, the whole figuring that thing out was kind of interesting because the company that took it over, I don't know why they didn't know that we were already excited and they would seem like they would have already done that. But, you know. So, the, the report that Director Larson had found, what, that was from 2019, right? But Who was accredited? Is that? Yeah. The oh one, no. The the one which, that said we did in the was. The oh yeah, that was, that was what something right. that um was done. I forget the leader leader who was. Yeah. Somebody did an audit of Foster High School previously. Yeah, and that that's where they said okay. that we weren't accredited. And then I went and looked on the ESD website, and they listed the accreditation under the old system, which was basically. Everybody in South Bean County, except for Seattle, Tickle, and Federal Way. We had to find the actual certificate. So <laughs> we found it, you know, so that was that was good. Okay, so the PS, PSD site was just incorrect? It must have been. Yeah. Because we, we are accredited. So for the 22, 23. So through 2024. Oh, through 2024. Okay. So okay. We yeah. okay. We will be updating. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. My. So that was done under the the ESD process, the old one, ASE, whatever it is called. Is that ASCD or something? Yeah, I'm something not like that. Sure about the previous traffic, but oh, here it is. Yeah, leading edge advisor. That was the report. So if we've been accredited previously, how does that make the new process a little bit more reachable? Well, I think the new process is fine. I mean, we've we've been talking about that about the board stadium so. Um, I think, you know, the accreditation process has a lot of positive associated with it, and we have been accredited in the past, and I think they have a good roadmap on that, and the thing that's different about this one is looking at all the schools, uh, and the district yeah. overall, right. so I think it fits into a lot of what we're trying to do with alignment, kind of strategic planning, all of that, so okay. that that is that would not have been the case previously, because previously it just was fostered. Yeah, that's so the ESD site. It's it's just high schools that yeah. are recording. So I think it's doesn't seem like it's typical for you know all schools to do a whole thing. To, to do a whole thing. But Correct. not that I mean it could be a good idea. But, right. And that's yeah. And I guess I think you somewhere just answered the question of whether we should have yeah you know, a board policy. I mean the state says it's optional, mm -hmm. and so. But if we want to have that, I mean, we could do that as a policy. And I guess you guys will come with a recommendation about yeah. how to do that. We can certainly do that. It will be presented in June 2023. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited about that. Um, which I just want to, I think as I was just looking at this again, I just appreciate that already some of those elements are coming through in this. I think that gives us some, you know, some insight to really be able to. Um, to support and follow up in a way that you know does better on us. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, so, I just want to make sure that our you know that this work gets tied into our rate to the race and equity work and also the strategic plan because sometimes we have this tendency to have multiple things going on at the same time and then they don't kind of yeah but we are trying yeah. to be efficient with time <laughs> and resources. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So how much additional work will this cause administrative? That's part of what we're going to be talking through that because it hasn't happened at the middle school at an elementary. So we'll have to talk through like what does this mean? I wanna we want to make sure we're talking with the company about kind of what the bandwidth is and requirements. And so we'll be going through that process, but then because that has the potential to provide a good structured way of, of doing what they should be doing anyway, is looking at you know school improvements and how they can get right. there. So okay. hopefully it should fit into the things that they're yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Just so we have enough support for everybody. Yeah, and that was actually something that we talked just briefly about even today. 
um, like what uh, there's you know, there's a meeting that's going to happen on October 21st. That's really kind of that first time of bringing everyone together. Um, and so um, we'll likely get some more information on what that looks like and what supports are being requested by the administrators so that we can ensure that um, great, great. There, there will definitely be follow up around that piece. Okay. Um, questions, additional questions around the gifting and advancement point. Any additional questions here? Yeah, so I guess I was again, I was looking for the you know, the kind of the how the race and equity questions are applied here. So, um, I see the okay, so the breakdown, um, and I see you know, at Show Walter, uh, MLL students are you know, significantly underrepresented, and I see Latinx significantly underrepresented. At Foster, the races seem to be pretty, yeah. pretty even across, which is great. A um, little underrepresented on the MLL students, but so the question, you know, I guess it's going to come down to, um, you know, when I look at the rubric questions, the first question is who are the underrepresented groups, and so we can kind of see that here. Then the next question is. You know, does this policy program worsen existing disparities and have, how have you intentionally involved stakeholders? Blah, blah, blah. So, I mean, I think we need um, the follow up on the rest of the questions on this one. And actually, yeah, on, on some of them. So, um, that's where I was going back, and we, we discussed that earlier about the race and equity. We probably need a you know, kind of a one page form that just kind of template here are the questions we have. And I guess, I don't know, when we talk about technology, I noticed that there was a different set of questions. So my first, the first thing is, do we have the same, we need, we need to all be working on the same set of questions. Mm -hmm. And so, and I, you know, this is what's on the website is this rubric one. So that's what I've been working off of, but then we need to see those questions you know, this is a place for sure. This one needs the race and equity questions answered and addressed. So it looks like this uh, presentation has step one, which is who are the groups? And then the next question is, okay, the analysis of the underrepresented and why, and what are we gonna do about it? Yeah, I think ultimately that 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 what's next? Yeah, yeah. We, we, we see the data. We see, uh, yeah. So now, now, how are we gonna? Yeah, what's the what's the what's the behavior right that we're gonna put in place? To, yeah, what are the, what are the barriers to yeah. the yeah. to the? Why do we not have more that next students in honors um, courses at Chile? What are the barriers to them? Yeah, how do we knock them down? Yeah, and actually, that was a, one of the questions that I had had around that. And it looks like there's a new, some new teachers hired at Foster to support Latinx students that you think might come and uh, bring in more. Um, but I think my question was originally was around show alter, like how we can potentially increase, like why are those not matching, right? So what is it about the AP classes and at Foster that's attracting folks and how can we really increase that at show alter? I can, I'm gonna give a 
of the fault at foster you can self select and at show walter it is based on a recommendation um and so i'm glad that we are going to have an opportunity for peter sound esd to walk us through this race and equity um piece so that we can examine our own biases mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, see that that would be a good, you know, step. This is the next step we're gonna do. So yep. I would say good. <laughs> yeah. Let us know what happens. Yeah. Uh great. Any others on that one? Okay. Um tech plan updates. So this is the one where I was trying to, so you have these A through J questions and I was, that's where I was kind of getting a little confused. Are those the questions that we're using for the race and equity questions or, I mean, do no, are we all using the these, three questions? <laughs> these were more, I think, uh, for these, the A through J questions. I think those are the ones that were kind of from the initial board presentation protocol piece that we were just discussing. Uh, these? Yes. Okay. Oh, they don't look like it. No. They look like they're just Maybe it's a combination. kind of extended. Okay. I mean, I look at this at the six or the five that were, you know, th these are the ones that are on the website and the race and equity team. These look like kind of a little bit enhanced versions of that. And I don't know if does the race and equity, yeah, there are some good questions in here. And I, I don't know if the race and equity team has kind of working on expanding them, or I don't know where these came from exactly, but we just all need to be on the same page. Yeah. Yeah. The one we use with this guy in Puget Sound ESD, it has four different sets of questions. Okay. Um, it's the one that, that I've seen most used in our schools uh, by different departments. Um, and the I, worksheet the step one, step yeah. two, step three, step four. Some of those are like combined, right? There's multi questions within one, right? Yes. Okay, so these are just kind of those questions separated out. They could be. Okay. Yes. Because yes. they look kind of. <laughs> like, for instance, the first question on here is. Um, what does your department, division, school, district define as racial equity, racially equitable outcomes related to this issue? Next one is how will leadership communicate key outcomes to stakeholders for racial equity to guide uh, analysis? Yeah, I just think we need to. Yeah, on the same page. Yeah. <laughs> we have talked about this earlier today too, just kind of the consistency of language. Yeah. Um, and that would come through in the questions too, so that we're people are looking for the same questions. Yeah, so, yeah. I want to make sure I'm right. that the rubric is the same yes. as, as the person is <laughs> answering the question so that we're on the same page. And if I remember correctly in the last I think it might have been your either superintendent report or risk equity report, report last time, like that's going to be potentially looking at the risk equity toolkit, how we're using it is going to be some of the work that we're doing with TSCSD. Yes. Okay. Um, and then, you know, I know that there was different variations of you know, kind of onboarding folks into that tool um, that we can kind of reinforce. So can we get, I don't know, do you need to kind of think about which one we're using or? No, I mean, How the one we it? have is the one on the left is the one that we adopted. Right. That's the one on the website is the one we right. talked about. So, right. again, I'd have to take a look at each of those questions to see if they're just embedded within those five. I haven't kind of cross referenced them. Um, yeah, I think, I don't know, I haven't done that complete analysis, but they're kind of, kind of there. Um, okay. Um, the, I guess the other probably more, well, the other question I have on this is when I was looking through this analysis, I don't, I see, I mean, the race and equity is, is looking for 
you know, it starts with the underrepresented or federal subgroups. And I see references to ELL or MLL students. I see references to special education students. I see references to low income students. I don't see any, any analysis related to race. So black, white, Latinx. And um, so that seems to me missing from this analysis. And just to give you a for example, if I did that, for example, I'll talk about this a little bit more about science. Um, if you look at, for example, um, Thorndike, which has twice, about twice as many, twice the percentage of black students as at Cascade View and Pickwell Elementary, and you look at their science scores, they're significantly lower. And I'll go through this analysis more, but um, Thorndike is the one school that has not had both a robust creative learning labs and robotics program. And I know there's, you know, in the process of dealing with that, but yeah, that's the kind of kind of racial analysis that I would look for to say, you know, we have and their and their science scores, the black science election science scores at Thorndike are, are really low, they're less than 10 percent. And so then I would tie that to, well, are we delivering, you know, the the same opportunities to them and it looks to me like we are not and therefore and i know we're already kind of in the process of, yeah. of remedying that but that's the kind of analysis that you know i would expect to see on this um which yeah i don't you know i mean I, it's fine for those other groups that's good but you know i think we still we need to get down into the the racial analysis as well So focusing on categorical, such as special education and English language learner. That's fine. Basically what the report that I submitted. Yeah, I, yeah. That's what I pointed out in it. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, that's what I say. And I see and I believe, like, a reference to low income. Yeah, yeah. But I don't see any reference to any of the racial groups. Um, my understanding is they're part of these groups. Um, they are, they but they are separate. The yeah. They make up the you know, categorical programming like everyone else. You know, That was my thinking. Well, but if you disaggregate, you know, there's white, black, Latinx, Asian, and they're, you know, I will show in our district, we have the same gaps that the dis that everybody has, white and Asian students and black, Latinx, Pacific Islanders. And so, I mean, I think we need to, you know, identify in our system where those, those gaps are, and then what we're going to do about it. And so, like I say, the example was, you know, I didn't go, have to go too far to see the, the, you know, I mean, how we implemented creative learning labs mm -hmm. was problematic. You know, I mean, we dealt with the equity issue and, and yes. particularly Thorndike, you know, got the short end of some of that deal. So, mm -hmm. and we just need to, you know, kind of recognize those and then move forward with the, with the solutions to fix it. So. Mm -hmm. To me, that's what the race and equity is about. Which we're doing. Yeah, which we're doing. But I think I think just to see that you know documented in the analysis is because I don't I've not seen yet, like I say, the full you know Dr. Worshay's you know uh, on the gifted uh, highly capable program. We see the start of it. You know, it's breaking broken out by race and what all the results are, and then the next step is okay. Here's what we do. Boom, boom, boom. But I don't see I don't see that. Break out in this analysis. So we have the equity, but just not the race side of that. <laughs> yeah. 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 And that's the difference between, I mean, that's one of the things we always say we got from our students when we were talking about an equity policy and put it to the students. They said, no, you really need to put race in there as the as the number one thing, which is not what every, you know, most districts don't do that. They just have an equity policy. So, so Jeff, is that something that could be easily created with this information you have? Well, you know, what we've, what we've discussed here are the strategies that we're doing that we need to do to equal the playing field. Um, those strategies are contained in the report and on the creative learning lab section of it. Um, you know, we, uh, we pay teacher salaries, supplies, we're buying new curriculum, um, upgrading the new curriculum, um, the transition to that new curriculum. Um, and so that's across all four labs in the district. Right. Um, and 
is in that, included in that is the robotics program and those in traditional things that those teachers are doing. So are all the robotics programs up in each school? We're getting there. Getting there. Getting there. So that's one laid the ground. Yeah. I mean, it was it was up, and I'll show some data uh, later. But it was up at Cascade View and Tuckwell Elementary, right. but it was not up at Thorndike. And I think too, like you know, the the strategies, you know, these may be their right strategies and the effective strategies that are going to help us, right? Mm -hmm. you know, really eliminate some of those gaps. And um, how are we going to know that if we don't know really where those gaps are, right? So I think that's that's really the point. Um, is we need to make sure that we're looking at all of the potential indicators and data points that we can to make sure that we are that these strategies are actually raising right the the access to our Latinx and our Black students if they're if they're further from those access points. So we need to have the starting point. And then the, the finish point, we can actually see the data that says, yeah, these strategies work for everyone, right? But it's like with anything, when we're thinking about equity, you know, so much of the time we think about, we kind of have this backwards approach, right? Whereas we should you know, think about what's going to work the best for everyone. Um, and then we implement that thing. And yeah, that works for most folks. But who it doesn't help is the folks that are farthest away from those access points already. Right, so when we think about who is furthest away, right, and then what is the strategy that will support them, we're going to in turn support everyone, right? So really thinking at that lowest level versus that the, the, the highest level. It's just hard to write outcomes when we haven't done this yet. We know our baseline for our rate where we are with the weight pass that at Thorndike Elementary School. We have a set of strategies here that we're going to try that have been successful at other buildings. It's hard to project um, what the outcomes are going to be. Um, I feel like we're taking the right approach like we've done in other buildings. And you're gonna demonstrate and show some success with those strategies. And so, again, it's hard to write about something that we haven't tried yet. I mean, so I think I think all we're looking for is this is all I'm looking for is say okay here we have this issue we have this gap here's what we're doing right. and we expect you know based on other evidence based that this right. will right. that this will improve right. and then next year we'll check did right. it improve right. yeah it, it went up and you know are you going to be able to turn around Thorndike you know in a second maybe not it may take a couple of years. But, you know, I mean, as for me, I, I just want to see, is it going up? Is it going up? Is it going up? And we have, again, we have the demographic data available mm -hmm. because we have the demographic broken out by equity pieces. So we just need to add that information in on the race, race demographic. Yeah, I just want to, you know, that the, when you do the analysis, the evidence that you're, you thought through the race issues, and then, you know, like, you know, you have the strategies, I think, in place. It just, I think it needs to be explicit that you just, just document what you're doing. And I think because, you know, as I say, we don't, I mean, this is hard getting, <laughs> getting to, um, you know, race issues can be hard to deal with, but we need to put them out on the table and then deal with them. Yeah, I have, I have no problem. Yeah. That. Okay. Yeah, well, it That's is. all. Thanks, Jeff. Any more no, I said thanks, Jeff. <laughs> okay, questions, additional questions on the I ready for current students on the communication. Uh, I was just wondering, can you talk a bit about like parents' students for example? And you know, it was mentioned on the same uh getting under the cloud I already like the last I I Remember, it was mentioned somewhere that it was going to have to like take the I ready lesson at home and have like homework every day or something. And I was like, oh, that's not. So, what was mentioned was that after students do the initial I ready assessment, then they will create pathways for them to do lessons. 
So it says has the first I read the section. I'm really sorry. I know. And yeah, for this question, Mr. Seven, you haven't taken your I ready assessment. As <laughs> learned, I don't think that's the season and you would. Okay, there's just something to have. The window closes on Friday, September 30th. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> window closes on Friday, September 30th. So, do you know if the elementaries have all done their I ratings? The elementary, um, the middle school, and in looking at an overview of Foster, Foster, there are some students who are taking it as well. And what class do they take that in? They would take it in their math or their um, English class. Um, that would be ideal. Um, yeah, so I'm speaking with the staff tomorrow. And, and then that information will go to the parents. Yes. Once it's all done. Once it's all done. And do you know when that might be? Well, since they're done on September 30th, um, one of the things that we want to do is share out with the parents how to understand the items for the students to see. I mean, that's why it takes some time, but because we want to make sure that that information is also translated um, as well. So Thanks. That's the okay. Okay. So interest, interested in the uh, the reports that the parents well, and the students actually get relative to, you know, how well they've done. I mean, does it provide them any? information that's useful to that they can take action on and so you sent me some of these reference to some of the uh, reports and you know it, these domains seem really high level to me so you know domain number numbers and operations okay they're at grade level i mean what does that really tell a parent or a student about um you know are they having trouble with division are they having trouble you know I mean, I'm just wondering if there's, um, and you know, provides enough information back to the students and parents that they can actually take action on, or is this just kind of a, you know, status? There you are. <laughs> Good question. So when you talk about the domains, yeah, you talk about numbers and operations. Yeah, that's essentially numbers sense. Yeah. So the work that the students would be doing in the classroom would be centered on numbers sense. Mm -hmm. So the parent may not understand numbers and operations. Yeah. But numbers sense meaning one to one correspondence or being able to count from one until or being able to use numbers. Um, and so again, as the students are doing work in the classrooms. Then that communication from the classroom home would be not numbers and operation, right. but it would be the thing that you're working on that speaks to that standard. Right. So that is the information um, that we want to make sure that our parents understand via the teachers as you're speaking down the line. But the information that we're going to send home is just telling parents what these numbers mean as it relates to where your student is. In their grade. And so then with that information, here's the work that we're doing at the schools to help your students grow. And as students continue to grow, we'll get to proficiency. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's that so they're getting some kind of connection there between what the IREADY report says and what the teachers what the what's going on in the classroom. Yes. Yeah. Um, because, you know, it seems like a lot of this, um, when you're trying to provide, you know, meaningful feedback to students, you know, it needs to be timely and actionable. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure. So from the time the students take the test to the time they get this I ready report back is probably what, a few weeks? Well. Or, 
it's, it should be. Okay. It could be. Okay. So here's here's the plan that we were talking about on Monday again. So we had a conversation on September 6th with principals and staff. And they're working on student achievement goals. Right. And so even in speaking with the students, they said that just taking the I rating test is not enough for me. Right. But when someone sits down and gives me a meaningful connection to what I've done. Right. And then I can sit down and write a goal right. from kindergarten all the way up into 12th grade. It means more. Right. So that is the action that students will be working on after they take the IRB. So the window closes on September 30th, and then all of the goals will be written after that. Day. So the window is hopefully 10 days after that, every student will have an I, uh, a goal for reading and math or math and language arts. And so that goal that they would come up with would be um, pulled from information. From the math. teacher would help them set that goal based yes. on what they see in the tests and what they've seen in the classroom work and so forth. Okay. Right. Yeah, because that's, I was going back and looking through some of um, John Hetty's research about, you know, what's the most yeah. effect size and, and that idea of uh, student, you know, goals is one of the highest. And it's interesting that the highest is actually teachers collaborating, working together, which is one of my things. I've been. <laughs> which I know Dr. Brochet is working very hard to get those staff members working together. Yeah, which is why I'd like to see, you know, recognition for teams more often than yeah. for individuals because of that effect. Anyway, okay, yeah, as long as we have a good, you know, because I, I think that's, absolutely key to get that information back to students quickly and and to the degree that you can connect it to iReady because I think a lot of students are disconnected from iReady because they don't they don't understand it they don't see how it's helping them but if you can somehow and I'm not sure you know maybe we need to go to iReady and get some better feedback I mean you know one of the things we talked about and we probably don't allow this but you know, if students, well, particularly for, you know, we, we find one of those students that just did this, you know, went through them really fast. And so hopefully somebody goes and asks them, okay, what happened? You know, so they had a bad day, you know, something was going on at home, whatever. And would we allow them to take another, to take the test again? Okay, that's good. Yeah. I think a lot of, you know, and if students get to the point where they're motivated and say, you know, I just, I messed up for some reason on that day. Can I do it again? Well, I didn't understand why. Yeah, or I didn't understand, you know, whatever. And then allow them to, you know, get back into it, engage in it. Yeah, so that was the other, if we have that aspect of it, that's, I think, really important too. So yeah. that's great. And that was why I asked about the timeline, because I've had some parents ask me, when will we find out about I Ready Schools? That Dr. Ready was. Yeah, it is good that they're interested in knowing. But I, I didn't have an answer. <laughs> so, so I right. really, yeah, I really commend you on this uh, this plan here because yes. I think that's really going to be key that we've been missing that and getting students to understand it and parents to understand it. And, you know, that'll improve a lot, I think. <laughs> and I also want to just say in my appreciation the fact that it's from kindergarten through 12th grade. I think that's so important to just, you know, um, um, resisting the urge to have no adultism seep into our work, right? Mm -hmm. Kindergartners are so capable of making goals um, and, and thinking about thinking critically about that. So thank you for, for really helping to get that um, at the elementary level. And kindergartners set very high expectations for themselves. <laughs> 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 Uh, you know, like right now, the students have to have finished the iron and that stuff after. I can email that information to you. Repeat that one of the comments to you. Yeah, thank you. Because I'm afraid that some of the friends that students aren't getting kind of like notifications. I like I see a lot of friends that students and like we know that are that I already supposed to be happening, but we don't know what they can do in them mm -hmm. and. Like in my advice, on my version of like eight or class, we haven't received any like notification about it. Thank you for the information. Is that a situation where like the window closes and closes? The window closes and closes, but we can ask for them to okay. call in to open it up with students. Yes, we can. Like certainly, we don't want to make sure that we're not 
in the midst of, yeah, students are negatively impacted, right, with the inability to have taken this. this yeah. um, okay. Moving on to the sexual harassment, the harassment prohibited annual report. Any additional questions on this one? Yeah. Dennis, can I ask you to speak up a little bit? Yes, sorry. Thank you. Um, I, was, I was wondering, looking at the, you said that you self identify self participants. Like, what were your criteria for selecting those people? Mm -hmm. So, I, I would like to front load this by saying that it, um, what, what we set out to accomplish uh, turned out to be a learning experience. Um, in talking and having conversations with people, I thought it would be easy to jump in and just start asking these questions. And what I learned was that it, that people were it was a very sensitive topic to have conversations about. And so uh, after my first two conversations, I stopped and I thought that maybe having one-on-one -on -one conversations with people that are from across the case ball, Chris. Uh, Continuum. So I looked um, for staff. I was looking for elementary, uh, middle school, high school. And then I was also looking at age, gender, identity, and um, race and ethnicity, and then language. And then the same for the, uh, the students. And like some of the trends that we talk about, like what what do we what some of the questions they have, like what did they learn? Um, there was there was a trend saying that you know just that wasn't talked about a lot at school. And my question is, is there like a plan to increase the conversations about it and how frequently it happens? Because someone also said that it only happens like once a year. Basically. Excellent. So it was made very clear that this isn't something that is discussed among students uh, with their, their classrooms. Uh, I did learn through the conversation that there are specific teachers that will have conversations about this, but it isn't something that uh, people are inviting conversations about. Uh, the one referred to, there was one official uh, report register for the sexual harassment from in the 21 22 school year. But I, what I gather is that based on what people have are conveying, is that there are things that are happening and things that are being said that are not reported in any way. Yeah. yeah, that was kind of my concern when I see one. And, you know, a couple of meetings ago, we had three students in here talking about this issue. And, mm -hmm. You know, I, I find it really hard to believe. <laughs> I mean, I know it's more than one. And so um, in other districts, and you do talk about the anonymous reporting. I mean, other districts have that uh, pretty um, widely, I think. So getting getting that kind of help at least start to get a little more realistic. I know, I understand it's, it's harder to investigate when it's anonymous, but you start to get, you can set a little more realistic sense of actually how widespread it is probably. Which I think is is helpful. So, and do we know when the reported system is going to be coming out? What's the timeline for that? Yes, according to the timeline, we have it scheduled to come out for by second semester, which is January, February. Mm -hmm. Dennis, do you have some thoughts on this that you'd like to share with Aaron at some time? Uh, I think. I think, you know, but it would just mostly be about like increasing the conversations inside school, like educational wise. Because mm -hmm. I know that there's a plan to have to like talk to all the students in high school about about sexual assault, but I want to make sure that it's more in depth mm -hmm. and you know, of course, age appropriate, but also mm -hmm. more in depth and happens more frequently just once a year because 
it's important that we like have some of these conversations to happen. And you know, I was thinking from last year, obviously a lot of people already said that you know it a lot it happens to them too, like some you know it's more frequent. So just increasing awareness and education about it would be a good idea. Is there a reason it's taking till January to do this? Okay. If it's happening now, would for the reported system? Yeah. yeah, we wanted to make sure that it was done uh, thoroughly. Mm -hmm. uh, we have like several steps, phases that we're looking through, not just launching it and making sure that we need to make sure that there's somebody on the receiving end yeah, right. right. <laughs> that knows how to get in and make sure and, and access the reports that we're doing. Right. Yeah. Could student voice be included in this policy making? Yes. Yeah, and actually, the student, there was input from students as far as um, you know what do we know, um, what do we learn. We learned one of the things that we learned was that students are looking at uh, the policy that's written in the planners and are having like the conversations that are taking place at least at Joe Walter are centered around what's in the plan that's written in the plan. So that would be something that we would want to continue doing. Mm -hmm. um, if that makes sense. I'm just wondering if Dennis is like starting point. If Dennis is interested, in, it sounds like he's interested in that conversation with you about it, maybe. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. okay. And in the students at Falls High School as well, that are in the sexual assault awareness club, and they might be interested in talking mm -hmm. a little bit more about this. We have a club about that? Uh, yes, we do. Oh, wow. That's cool. Yeah. yeah, not to, to kind of reiterate what things have already said, but I think, you know, just looking at this report, the first thing that came to mind is this seems like such a uh, different picture from what we have heard, right? And what I think we know is happening um, in school districts, so, um, or in our, in our district. And I think just to, something just to Dennis's point about providing more opportunities to talk about it, the more that we normalize conversations, the more we destigmatize. Of talking about things, mm -hmm. right? And we create more and more safe opportunities for folks to, to just bring bring these things up. Um, so um, yeah, and, you know, I, again, I um, have you know these are some of the specific things that are really uh, you know the task force is going to be really looking at and examining, and then hopefully working you know with Aaron around some of like, those recommendations. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know Dennis is going to have a few results in that, um, that task force. The other thing that I was going to bring up, too, and I, I was looking back at the task force, it, I mean, it focuses around these policies 3205 and 511, but there's also this policy 3207, which is pro prohibition of harassment, intimidation, and bullying. Mm -hmm. So I would suggest you probably the task force should look at that one as well. It broadens that out a little bit. You said 32. 3207 okay. prohibits. Well, prohibition of harassment, intimidation, and bullying, because it, I mean, this one tends 3205 focus on sexual harassment, but there's also other kinds of intimidation and bullying that's going on that students talk about. And so, um, but they're all kind of tied together, I think, in terms of how we should deal with it. And so, yeah. Definitely can have that too. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions on this? Okay, increasing mental health supports. Um, so I think the two two big things that came up for me around um thank you. This is Definitely a move in the right direction. And I think I, you know, particularly after our conversation the other day, I'm, I had to kind of recenter and say, okay, we're not as far along as I would have liked to be, but here we are. Um, and now we're, you know, we're, 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 we're going to get there. I have no doubt. So, um, so thank you. Um, so a few, few kind of just follow up questions that came, came out of like um, around kind of some of the external providers that we partner with. I'm not really sure like what the, really the connection is there and um, what that partnership looks like but are full right and i understand like that is a that is a much larger scale problem than these few providers here in tuckwell like just mental health providers are just tapped out 
Um, and I'm just curious if, if there has been any um, um, opportunity or any work that's been done to potentially look into other providers in our area that may have some open space or even could dedicate you know, a certain amount of slots to our district. Um, just kind of what I guess creative work has been or discussions have having taken place, knowing that these outside agencies, um, Sound, Conseil, uh, and Child Haven are, are not really feasible options for us right now. So we will, I know that our council, our social workers are working on that. Okay. And we will have a meeting on October 3rd. So they will be able to share um, all of the interactions that they've had with those outside providers mm -hmm. outside of the waiting list what other um, providers are available to us okay. um something that i was thinking about and i have no idea like how this would work with you know school district but i know that we you know there are ways in which we we work with the local um, community college in the area um and in one of the um, I know big youth serving organizations um, in the county has partnered with um, a, a college to actually provide some mental health support within their programs. And so I'm wondering if if that might be an, an option to potentially pursue. Maybe that's you know, a way to support folks that are in counseling programs to come in and do you know, get some of their hours and also support our young people. Um, so that just might be a, a creative way to potentially get extra resources that are in this work. Um, you know, uh, thanks for that recommendation. Yeah. Um, I noticed earlier that um, I think Jennifer Jones had her hand raised. I wasn't sure if um, you still had something you wanted to um, to, to share. Um, Dr. Borshay, um answered it. Okay. okay. The question I had was, um, so the the state is going to be adding, when I added up, essentially one uh, one FTE of <clears throat> in this general area of council of social workers, you know, that whole area uh, per um, elementary school over the next three years, and they're doing it incrementally. But you know, fortunately, we have ESSER dollars that can kind of cover the shortfall for those two years and then fill in. So. It looks like each elementary school has chosen to get one, what they're calling SEL interventionist, which <clears throat> when I look at the, so it sounds like Tuckle Elementary has hired there already. There's already Cascade View and Thorndike are still um, out waiting for somebody. And I was kind of curious, it looked, so it looked like Thorndike was going for a um, uh, certified, uh, staff person and Bethlehem for um, Cascade View is going for a classified. What's the logic there? It looks when I look at the job description of these, it looks like they're kind of uh, utility <laughs> players. I mean, they're doing a little bit of everything, which um, I guess is okay. But I'm curious about why, because we're getting allocated a full, you know. Um, certified staff, which is more money than a classified staff would be. So what's the logic for doing? And I, I don't know, Stuckwell Elementary got a, a certified or a classified? Certified. Certified. So why is this going to be going um, Just at high level, other than them collaborating with staff. Yep. This is the direction that Cascade wanted to move in. So are they, take, are they then going to use the extra money that they are saving by not getting instructional for something else? Uh, it's a good question. I can find out. Okay. Mr. Gentleman, would you know? I can find out. It's just curious to me that, yeah, one would be, two would be doing instructional or certified and others would be. The other question I kind of had when I was looking at the uh, job visits or the job postings, there, allocated or they're indicated this is an ESSER funded position for 22-23. And <clears throat> I guess the question that seems to be sending out the signal that to people that this is this position is really only be funded for for one year, maybe two, which um 
I'm not sure why you want to send out that signal because it is going to be fully funded after the third year by, you know, the allocation of the state. And so if I'm a person looking at this, you know, I mean, and particularly for the social, uh, social welfare, social worker kind of positions, you know, we, most of the positions, I mean, it takes a year for, for somebody like that to know our students, know our community. And so we want them here for the long term. So it seems like if somebody's looking at that, oh, this is just a one year position. Do I want to go there? I don't I don't know. Is that the message that's coming out? It's maybe a more question for Aaron. I'm not sure. So would so instead of us us sharing and trying to be transparent that yeah. so with one year we should share there should be a two year or three year position. Well, I'm, I mean, what is our I mean, is our intention that that at the end of um you know when SR funds run out, it's gonna be gone. Because see, I think we are actually getting funded for that. I mean, particularly because the legislature is phasing that in at the end of three years or two years, so it is gonna be fully funded by the state. So why would we it will be fully funded? Yeah. Okay. One in each not, school? Yeah. Or just not, one not entirely fully funded. So Ms. Birdsong's been yeah. tracking that as well. I'm when I was looking at the numbers, it's 1.0, pretty close. Yes, but it's also um, contingent on the person in the position. Contingent on the person in the position and where they fall on the salary schedule. Oh, you know, that's like, that's correct. Like, yeah, 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 you're right. You're right. Yeah, so yeah. Each year, it's, in my it's, it's funded, but, <laughs> but it may fun. not. Yeah, correct. you can't guarantee that it's going to right be there that's true yeah yeah so it is funded so uh but yeah i don't know I, I'm, I'm not sure what messages people are getting when they see oh this is an esther funded is that singing out to everybody oh this is just a one year and they're and and, they, and and i'm out and is that the kind of person that we want well i guess the message is it is contingent upon <laughs> funds. so yeah if this is something that you okay. want to do until funds run out yeah. Okay. I mean, I, as I noticed, obviously, I don't know, we haven't filled these two positions. Yet. So this is like having a grant position. You want to let them know that this is a grant funded position. And once well, grant is, is it, it really does run out. This one, the money is not running out, but the position may go away because of yes. CBA agreements. Yeah. But <laughs> And I think the conversations around me spoke with kind of the front loading of Esther and knowing that some of the positions might not received a full recuperation from the state, depending on the person, is that through the budgeting process, there's all sorts of things that we'll have discussions about prioritizing too. So I think the idea is to make sure that we've got the positions to see what the impact is, figure out where that fits in the prioritization when we're talking about budgeting. Um, mm -hmm. All of that juxtaposed with our enrollment and other aspects that mm -hmm. can be possible. So. We've got a lot of, you know, difficult prioritization mm -hmm. doing, and a lot of needs and support that we're trying to get to our students and families for sure. So um, I think it's, you know, we do want to be upfront with people so that they at least have some idea. I understand that kind of what what kind of draw you're going to get if somebody yeah. sees that particular piece. But yeah. on the other hand, if I were a client, I'd rather know that upfront mm -hmm. than just to get in and then figure out, oh, after a year, what this position might be going away, they might feel like, you know, they've been. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, it's a tricky balancing, but I mean, clearly these positions, you know, we want somebody who's going to invest in our community and yeah. stick around. Absolutely. So, okay. Thank you. One of the things that stuck out to me, which I think I knew already before I got this information, um, you know, it just things look so different um, at every school. And I know that, you know, there's there needs to, of course, be space for that as every school community is different. And, you know, I, I, think, I don't know if I was talking to you about this or, or, or not, but you know, this idea of like, how can we create a moment where a family's experience is consistent, right? Um, regardless of the elementary or the school they go to all the way elementary middle and high school and so i you know i and then also thinking about like early interventions you know elementary is the time to really do that and so i you know i wonder if there's ways that we can 
unify to some degree and strengthen what's happening at each elementary school and almost like creating a team across elementary schools that help support these plans at all of them. Um, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know what that would look like, but just some some way of really kind of creating a like this is this is how we we navigate social emotional learning and mental health supports in all of our elementary schools. And that was a little different, but this is kind of like our 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 process and how we as a whole district team are supporting that. Like the, just the last thing, and I, I spoke to Dr. Henry about this morning, and Eric, you kind of alluded to it earlier, is, you know, I think, um, and this actually came up at the Parent Advisory Committee um, the other day, of like, what do we mean when we say certain words? Um, and I think even, you know, I, I think I probably contributed this in a way, like really muddying SEL and mental health, right? They're very connected, but they're also separate things. Um, and, um, you know, so I, I think we're going to add to a, an agenda item soon, just some kind of some dialogue amongst the the, the uh, all all of us like collectively to really say what do we as a technology mean when we say community? What do we mean when we say social emotional learning? What do we mean when we say I don't like so so that there's really more just intentionality? Um, because again, I mean, even though we just like. They're, they're, mud, they're muddied a little bit, and um, I, I want to get some real clarity about that so that we can actually be, be intentional about the supports that we're, you know, that we're creating. So I'm just, so. well, just an observation. Any additional questions, please? Thank you. I did send the information about the IOD. <laughs> Uh, she says she sent you information about Ivan in your inbox. Okay. Um, awesome. That moves us to, oh, there's one more. 20, 20, wait. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh yeah, Tarcoola School District and State SBA data. Sorry about what she's doing. Yeah, what she's doing. Okay. <laughs> so um, the order balance assessment scores came out a few weeks ago, and as I'm prone to do, I try to do a little analysis on on what's going on and I'm not going to talk in depth about all these graphs, but uh, a few of them. <clears throat> This first one is always interesting to me because it's it's the King County School Districts. This is district level data, and it's the reading test, and it's proficiency rates versus um, free and reduced lunch rate, which is low income percentage. And you know, we always say that um, test scores are highly correlated to income. Turns out they're almost completely correlated to income. This this R squared of, of 0.97 R squared is a is a statistical measure of the fit. A perfect fit is 1.0. I mean, you can't get much of a better fit than uh, this. And so, you know, when you from a state level, if you look at this and you say, if money makes this much difference, then we should be putting a lot more dollars in all those districts on the right hand side of this, mm -hmm. which is exactly not what the state does. <laughs> the state actually, according to the um, Education Law Center back in Rutgers University that looks at states across the country, we have actually a regressive funding system that actually puts more money, not a whole lot, but more money in the in the higher uh, income schools. So you know, when when we're looking at school, when we're looking at these scores, we need to keep in mind that the context we're in, and that is we're in a state that, you know, funds it completely backwards. And so therefore you get these results, you know, the same results year after year after year after year. And so um, it's important to understand that when we, you know, look at kind of where we are in that, in that position. The, the okay. second, uh, look, if I could respond. Yeah. So the only thing that I I can definitely understand where that's that's coming from the the concern that we have is we also don't want to project that 
because correct you are in a low income school or a district mm -hmm. your outcome is predetermined correct mm -hmm. so yeah let's, I mean, let's say we just want to make sure we're not sending that message yeah that. two things about this um one is <laughs> you know first of all when i look at this you know at the district level you don't even need to take the test i can just just tell me your pre real lunch i'll tell you my test is that's at the district level second this is not about um, deficiency in students. A lot of times these gaps, you know, people say, well, I shouldn't talk about that because it's not about a deficiency in students. It's about deficiencies in the system that we have. And that's why we absolutely need to be talking about these things. And second, and the, the other thing is, you know, well, a couple of other things. One is the, I think one of the best education data analysts in the state, Pete Bellisman, who retired a few years ago, he was constantly on the state to present this data in terms of how are you doing relative to other districts that are similar to you? Uh, he called them peer districts. And, um, and you know, when that happens, it rarely happens in the state. The state rarely does that. But for example, it happened recently when the Center for Educational Effectiveness, so the group that does our surveys and we're working on a strategic plan, did um, a study of what they call positive outlier schools. And so what they were looking at is, okay, given, given your income, you know, we want to, in this case, it would be like districts that are above the line, positive outline or above the line. So you're performing much better than you would be expected given the income level. And when you do that, you know, one of the, I think seven high schools in the state was Foster High School. And they looked at, I mean, they looked at more than just test scores, but they looked at other things. And so, you know, it's, it's, um, Anytime, and I'm going to show another example of some data that came this year where we scored, you know, significantly above the line. So, you know, we those are celebrations we had, um, understanding that we're operating within the context of the system that severely uh, underfunds us. Um, but you know, this is this is the SLA. If you can go to the next slide, it's it's the same story in math. So there's no big. Um, uh, mystery there. That's also district wide. Now, this next one is an interesting one because this is some data that you know shows you know significantly above the line. So these are all the the King County Grade Five schools, and there's obviously a lot more. The spread, the the scatter plot gets a little more scattered, but it's still super highly correlated to uh, income. And this is fifth grade science. And you know, you notice Cascade View there is way above the line, which is that's outstanding work. Techville Elementary is above the line, and Thorndike's below the line. So then we kind of say, well, what's going on with that? So I'll go to the next slide. Um, so this is where it gets interesting. Um, if we go back and think about uh, the creative learning labs, which you know, we made a significant investment in those a number of years ago. And, you know, that's highly related to science thinking because it's it's hands-on, it's experimentation. That's what all that stuff is about. And when we look at, you know, when we started doing that, and I have here, you know, the different schools, um, Tuckle Elementary, Thorndike, Heskey View, the fifth grade science scores, and then the state above it. So Cascade or Tuckle Elementary has been pretty consistent all the way through. And the reason is they, from the beginning, they had a full robust computer um, uh, creative learning lab, plus a full robust robotics program going. Mm -hmm. And you can see, and so even today, you know, they're now above the state average, which anytime our just we have a just it happens occasionally when it's above the state average, that's Super outstanding work, uh, given given again given the funding system that we have in the state, and so then we see uh, Thorndike and Cascade do were not implemented with full uh, implementation. You know, I think Cascade View it was the first year was like the third grade did it or something, and Thorndike it was the first grade, and then I know at Thorndike there was a there's a obviously a period in there between 1819 and 2022 where COVID was happening and we didn't have scores, but um, Thorndike actually lost their uh, creative learning uh, labs teacher retired and they have a new one and then the robotics program kind of got discontinued uh, and so but you'll notice at Cascade View between 1819 and 2122 
it's it's skyrocketed. And you know, I know um, having worked with um, the robotics teacher up there, who's also the creative learning science teacher, she's outstanding. And you can see the difference that that makes in science course. I mean, all of a sudden now, Cascade View, which is at like eighty percent uh, free and reduced lunch, is now above the state average in science. I mean, that's that's outstanding uh, work. And and then Thorndike, you know, you say, well, what's going on? Well, you know, they we lost kind of the creative learning labs. The creative learning labs is there, but we don't have the robotics program, but we're getting it back. So, uh, you know, hopefully next year we'll be able to see that kind of uh, bump up in, in, in that. So, and the other uh, story about this, and, you know, obviously I don't know everything that was going on in this thing, but I can definitely relate it to the creative learning labs. The interesting thing uh, also at Cascade View that I want to point out in terms of, of strategies is that um, I've been working with the robotics teacher up there for, for many years, and she's decided that she wants to, you know, um, move on to something else. And so what happened was last year she recruited the creative learning labs teacher, and she and I all we all three of us got the robotics. So there's a smooth transition over to the so now all of a sudden, you know, I mean, I anticipate, you know, we'll have that same outstanding uh, performance going forward. And, you know, unfortunately, like at Thorndike, the, the teacher retired and was doing robotics and there wasn't that smooth transition. And so anyway, it's just a, um, this is a pitch for a couple of things. One is thinking about smooth transitions wherever possible. Mm -hmm. And also, let's make sure that we continue to fund this creative learning maps program. And it's technology; it's heavy technology based, and so we need to be upgrading it. But it produces these kind of results, and so uh, it was a great investment that we did. And and now we just need to make sure that all our students are getting getting access to that. Um, the next one, I just so I was looking at the all the. Um, the SBA results and there's like 31 when you when you count different building combinations of building subject and grade level, you know, so, you know, uh, fifth grade science, third grade math, so forth. And if you look at them all, and if you put in, you know, a little adjustment for, uh, for uh, low income or poverty and bump it up a little bit based on the poverty, you know, these are like our top out of the 31, these are our top eight performing groups. And so um, you see Cascade View, uh, third, fifth grade uh, reading, technical elementary fifth grade reading. So the fifth grades did, did outstanding. They almost hit the state average. And if you kind of adjust for the income levels, they actually beat the state averages. But so outstanding work there. We talked about the science at Cascade View and technical elementary. The other one I wanted to point out was the uh, because it's really important is the uh, reading or English language at Foster in 10th grade. And the reading, that, the reason that one's so important is, although, you know, these days you don't have to pass the SBAC reading to graduate, it's one of the options that in order to graduate, you have to get, you know, some option of reading. It could be passing the SAT test or there's different options, but this is one of the main options. And so, you know, to have that one way up on the list is really, really good. So congratulations to the folks at Foster for that one. The three other ones below didn't quite get to the point of, of beating the state average, but they're still good. The um, reading at Showalter eighth grade and Cascade View third grade reading and um, at, uh, math at um, Jekyll Elementary. So these are kind of the, so I just wanted to celebrate the top um, performers in that group. Um, the next one, I, I'm just going to go through these really quick, but when you look at the state, this is the state the level, back to the state level, all grades, and this is the ELA test, and this is illustrating the, the racial gaps, so which are consistent year after year after year, Asian, white, two or more races, and then you know, Latinx, Black, um, Pacific Islander, and, and Native American, and you notice, of course, during the, the most recent, um, the COVID, every, everybody went down, you know, across the board. Uh, the, the racial gaps didn't increase much, but everybody went down. That's reading, if you go to the next one, it's the same kind of the same story with math. And if you go to the next one, the next one is the income. 
and that's the more relevant. The income gap in reading actually uh, increased, uh, which is consistent across the nation. So, you know, uh, again, money matters. Um, and then you go to the next slide, it's the math, same thing. Uh, everybody went down and the gap increased. And so in science is the next one, again, at the state level, again, went down, gap increased. So, you know, this, this story about um, income matters. So the last kind of set, and I won't talk about all these, but this is one, I always like to go back and do a little history. So this is going back to the district, Pepelo School District, and it's third grade reading. And, um, oh, sorry, ELAS back. Um, oh, okay. Oh, that, okay. Yeah, this is, no, sorry. This is, um, this is the racial gap. So as um, in the state, we also have the same race gaps and that's illustrated here in reading. And then the next one is the same one is the gaps, racial gaps in math for the Tuckwell School District. And um, our gaps aren't quite as big. That's only because the top group doesn't, is not as high. But we still have the same same racial gaps going on here. So the next one is the science. Yes, again, same gaps, same races. And go to the next one. Um, this is oh the income. Yeah, and we also have the same income gaps in our district. Reading, math, same income gaps. Okay, so this is the last one I'm going to spend a little time on, and that is this is third grade reading. Um, in the Tuckola School District over the last, um, since 1415 is going back to there. And I think it's, it's, it's always instructive to, to, to go back and say, you know, what was going on during these different times, you know? And if you go back to like uh, 2013, you see, so the, the Tuckola School District scores are the blue ones and the state are the, uh, the red ones. You know, we go back to 2013, we as a, as a district almost hit the state average in third grade reading, again, which is given the, again, given the income distribution in the, in the state, this is, this is outstanding. I mean, this, when you get that high. Now, since then, you know, everything has kind of gone down. You know, the state has gone down uh, significantly in 1415, and that's when SBAC hit. So, we know SBAC's a much harder test and everybody went down, but you know, we, we, we were within five points, five and a half points of the state back in 13. And now we're, you know, at 25 gap with the state. So, you know, what's been going on and this was brought up, you know, there's a lot of questions been read up in the, in the parents group brought this up, you know, is our, is our third grade reading literacy, uh, you know, uh, curriculum the best? You know, during that period, we also shifted from coaches to interventionists. Is that a good thing and not a good thing? You know, I think this brings up lots of questions for, you know, examining the third grade reading. And, you know, you can say, well, I mean, third grade reading is considered one of the key benchmarks. And there is this concept in education called the leaky pipeline, which um, basically says, you know, if you have these various benchmarks along the way, maybe ready for K, third grade reading, fifth grade math, you know, these things, and the output at the end is going to college and being getting a successful job. If you miss these benchmarks along the way, so, you know, if you aren't at uh, grade level or proficient in third grade reading, your chances of, you know, going to college and getting a great job go down significantly. So, you know, that and, and, it just, you know, I can show you some, um, I didn't bring them, but they're done at several different levels. And so it's really important that we kind of pay attention to these, um, particularly these, some of these elementary benchmark things, because they set students up for, you know, what's going to happen uh, in their future. So, um, and I think we really need to examine it. And I'll go to the next one. The next one is math, third grade math. And you see back in 13 year, we actually beat the state average. That was a phenomenal year uh, where, you know, took a look despite the income beat the state average. We've been going down since then. 
the one thing I will comment also, um, if you go back to like 2009, is that was or 10 was the first year of our new uh, math expressions. Uh, so it was the new curriculum fixed there. And if you look, and this is what, you know, in my opinion, a great uh, implementation of a curriculum looks like. <laughs> the next three years, boom, boom, boom. And we actually achieved, you know, beat the state average over three years. I mean, that was, that was outstanding implementation and a great lineup. The, you know, at the time, I remember I was working with uh, elementary math at that time, and I could see, you know, we had before the math expression, we had a curriculum that wasn't lined up with the standards. And I knew that was a teacher working with fifth grade, for example, fifth grade fractions is a big one. I mean, we didn't even teach in our open sequence fifth grade until after the test. <laughs> and so we were totally off. And by getting this new, uh, you know, uh, curriculum, and it was lined up, and we taught it, and, and it was well trained, and you can see the results that we can get from that. Now, since then, of course, the FBA has come in, and of course, you know, again, the state has gone down, everybody's gone down, but we've gone down even more. Um, and you know, switching from coaches to interventionists. Um, so you know, again, we need to kind of ex examine. I think you know, what we're doing and why that's happening, uh, because, you know, it's not, it's not good for the students. So um, I think that's, yeah, if you go to the next one, sixth grade reading, you can kind of do a similar analysis. We adopted a new reading curriculum, which, you know, that whole thing, the whole thing of um, what I call, I guess, the reading wars, which is phonics versus whole language. And you know it's similar to the old math curriculum of you know do you learn just algorithms or do you learn the why of math and all those things are about it's not you know one side or the other it's it's finding the right balance between the two and a lot of times that's tricky and I'm not sure we found the right balance I think we you know in reading we went kind of too far to the whole language we need to pull it back and I see in some of the trainings for this year there's phonics in there so which is good but. Uh, anyway, I think from time to time we need to go through and look at these uh, kind of historical data and say, okay, what were we doing? You know, what worked, what didn't work, and then make the adjustments. So, anyway, that's um, that's my spiel for this this year on the on the SBAC scores and what I learned from. Them. Uh, it looks like Director Bullerjack has her hand up. Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess my question, um, I want to take it to the next step, Dave. I appreciate, you know, you're uh, pulling those charts together and pointing that out to us. And you've done it before and you've done a great job. And how have we followed up on it? So um, is that something that, how, how does that happen? Maybe, um, Dr. Herndon or Dr. Borshade, how, how do we move? from this data that tells us some, some things worked and some things didn't to, um, you know, bringing either what was working back in or what isn't working out. How do we, how do we use this now? I will start by also suggesting that looking back at some data, in 2013, Common Core State Standards were also, um, there was professional development around Common Core State Standards in 2013, 2014. And so the work that was done seems to probably have also connected to Common Core State Standards. Our elementary staff will have a refresher tomorrow regarding Common Core State Standards and understanding the connection with what happens with what happens in the classroom as well as curriculum alignment that director larson was talking about that you have to teach those things prior to the assessment being given and if we're not doing that there's going to be a misalignment in terms of what students can demonstrate um, when the state assessment happens Secondary is going to have the coming for refresher October 12th. And so 
those types of conversations will then need to be followed up with, okay, so how does this impact your, <coughs> excuse me, how does this impact teaching and learning in the classroom? It's going to also talk to what the student work look like? What standards are we teaching to? Has the student mastered that standard? And then building on that and then spiraling, spiraling the curriculum after we are intentional about looking at student work throughout the entire system from although testing starts at, at third grade with SBAC, but looking at it from K through 12. So that becomes a tequila way of doing things. So I guess so your your kind of connection point is is still centered around like this is reflective of our um, a misalignment in instruction. So are there so is that really kind of like the big your biggest takeaway from this versus like particular other interventions? You know, like the yeah, I guess. <laughs> Why is that kind of the, the only place or the first part of place? And I, I say that because without doing core, intervention comes after you've done the core. Right. And so we will um, assess what it is that our students know and then add on intervention. And intervention is, will be for students who are who have yet to meet standards, who have met standards, and who are beyond standards. But we have to understand and strengthen our core first. And right now, it seems like our go-to is the intervention versus mm -hmm. everybody understanding what students should know, period. It's almost as if we got to get back to the basics. Yeah. And the other th the thing that I was concerned about is the whole, this whole thing of interventionist versus coaching models, which, you know, a number of years ago, we had, you know, coaches that were a little bit intervention. I mean, there's a little bit of each. And, you know, to me, part of that is about also the, you know, pull out, push in kind of thing, which, I mean, I, I believe we're trying to get away from the pull out and more push in. And, and you know, when I've seen what I saw a number of years ago, when coaches, we had a little, some really good coaches, they were providing support for all the teachers to teach all the core to everybody. <laughs> and so, you know, that's where it seems to me we've kind of gotten away from that and have kind of gotten, you know, just, you know, students that are having problems send them out, you know, somewhere, which yeah. is not, I mean, I mean, I'm pretty sure that's not what you're trying to do. And that's what we hear two different yeah. mindsets in yeah. that when you do intervention, you pull students out. No, we have to push in, but that's going to be a real mind right. set shift. Right. So. Yeah, and I think, but I think you know, there was a time in certain places that we did that in the past, and we need to kind of get get back to. And the thing. coaches will work with the yeah. adults to right. share different strategies versus okay, let me take a boost. Right. Yeah. Right. That's a major mind shift. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then I also was looking forward to you kind of at some point addressing the curriculum because I know, I mean, we heard from the parents that was on their mind is Lucy Hawkins and how that's how we're, you know, do we need a whole new reading curriculum? Do we, you know, there, when we originally uh, did our latest um, elementary reading curriculum, you know, we shortchanged, I believe, the, this training up front. And so that was an issue. And so, you know, these, these things are kind of all interconnected. I mean, is it the Problem with the curriculum? Is it the training? Is it the implementation? Is it, you know, you need to kind of figure out where all that is and, yeah. And then be able to explain it to the parents. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was, so, you know, it's, you know, we see a correlation between, you know, our score being lower as our school is, you know, a lot lower income and continues. And it sucks that, you know, it determines how much we fund it. And so it creates a pattern where we can get worse. So, and you know, and if we're not funded well, then there's other aspects of mental health and then students have to work doing it because there's more funding to grade at the student level. And 
So that's the reality. And it's unfortunate that it is that way, but I was gonna go back to there was um, the priority list we had for last that conference. Mm -hmm. There were I think 18 countries or however many of them. There were a list of that, and one of them was um advocating for low like low income schools in Plymouth more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if other schools also place that higher on the list or it would be beneficial to us. Or how much impact does it make by shaping that a little bit higher on the list and having to more for it? So I wrote that one <laughs> and it got voted on. And yeah, I guarantee you that that one will be on our list. Um, the 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 issue is it's a political problem in Olympia. And the this the straight out political problem is that you know the districts that are serving wealthy students, you know, they like the system the way it is. Of course, you know, I mean, you saw, you know, and so they, they don't want it to change and they, it turns out they have a lot of political power in there. I mean, it's just that blunt. So, you know, we need to kind of continue the fight on that um, at that level and just keep going at it, keep going at it. I'm, I actually sent some of this information just the other day up to, um, I have different strategies for trying to deal with this, but to uh, a Seattle Times writer who works with education. Uh, and occasionally they will publish some good articles on this kinds of issues, and which tends to put a little pressure on the legislature when it gets out. Now, hopefully somebody will do, you know, we'll see what, there's, they turn over writers up there a lot anyway. We'll see what happens with that. But there's all different strategies we can, uh, but it's, it's definitely an uphill battle for sure. I was watching the evening news and the raising of the tool. And <laughs> <laughs> that's another, that's another battle that I have with Olympia is there's been a couple of bills over the years and that I'm going to testify for that the, that the legislature should use an equity analysis for their bills. And they don't. And they don't. And they refuse to do it. And But it's, it's another one that's on our list of uh, uh, priorities. And last year, it, it, I was talking to one of the legislators who proposed that she's a um, former school board member up in Bellevue. And, and it turned out, this is, it gets into the technical stuff, but the Office of Financial Management, which kind of does all these analysis, they, they were resisting strongly doing it. They didn't want to do it. And I don't know why, if they didn't know how to do it, or they, you know, I mean, it's a politically charged topic in Olympia, for sure. And so um, it just, yeah, we just kind of keep going at it and keep going at it. And, and maybe we'll get little pieces here and here and now, but it's uh, yeah, it's just a blunt political hard topic. And I think it's important that Dakota, the community of Dakota, understands that while people will say that income is a determining factor, we have to keep in mind that education is a way out and a, a way to create a space at the table. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and this is not uh, preordained. You know, like I say, we can we can do things that make us above the line, and that's always within our control. At the same time, we're beating on Olympia to say, you know, let's let's level the playing field again. So it's not like there's, you know, we, we're just helpless or something. We absolutely can do a lot. Director Bullock. Yeah, I would just like to um, encourage us to get creative in, uh, I mean, we're telling the story that because we're uh, low income, our scores are low and the state doesn't fund us in the way that the state should. Um, maybe those are all truths, but let's get creative in how we deal with that. In that, what would we do if we had another million dollars from the state? Let's let's talk about what we would do with that, how we think we would improve our scores, our, our outcomes for our students if we had that money. And let's figure out how to get that money even if we don't get it from the state. So if what we're talking about is we need to have coaches and we need to have more, I mean, I, I don't know what we would do with the money. Would we have more staff in our buildings? Would we have better buildings? Would we have, what would we do with it? And 
let's go get it. Let's, you know, if we, if we need more people in our buildings, we have a lot of people in our community that are ready to help. And we can figure out how to use the people that we have here to make the difference, even if we don't have the money. Um, I think we can sit around and whine about not having the money or being, you know, not, not budgeted the way that we should be because of who we are, or what we have. Um, but I think we can solve it if, if we have the will to do that. But I have never heard us really saying what we would do if we had more money. Um, so that would, to me, that would come out of the discussion that we just had with Dave and the data that Dave has given us is to figure out what really would make the difference and let's do it. That's, that's where I am. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, we got, there's always, you know, we are where we are and there's lots of opportunities and I think Dr. Warshay is working on a lot of them. And, uh, but even, yeah, thinking, thinking, and this is, this is very good for, for advocacy work. If we figured out and if we could actually support with some data that said, okay, if we had this kind of money, you know, we've, we've, We've spent, you know, X amount of, and we've gotten seen this improvement, but if we had twice that, then we could see this improvement for even more students. That kind of data is really valuable, I think, going down to Olympia to convince them, them that they should invest more in us. If we show with a little bit of money, we're going to do all this, then, you know, so that's a good way to do it too. So I'm just like kind of processing. I'm just kind of like thinking about, um, you know, kind of even going back to larger conversation that we touched on at various points about like just as assessments as a whole, right? I know we have we have to do assessments, but I, I, I'm kind of latching onto what what you just talked about or what you just mentioned about, um, you know, when we're looking at testing data, perhaps low income could be a predictor of testing data. But what does that really mean about like what young people are actually learning, right? And you know, like going back to even like the basics of yes, we need to come core, but actually like education is all about teaching young people how to love learning, right? How to critically think about the world around them. So like maybe there are different measures that we can have um you know that's Yes, these are important to look at, but like, how are we really measuring what success looks like for individuals in our district? Um, you know that, you know that, that we can, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I completely agree. This is this is just one set of data, yeah. and and it's it's we tend to lean on it a little bit because it's it's already in place. It's easy to pick up, but you know the other um, things that. Um, you know, uh, creativity, uh, collaboration, all those kinds of things are really important um, as well. And and we need to look for for ways to to bring those out. You know, I mean, I think, you know, and it's it's about a lot of it's about celebrating some of the things that I mean. Last year we had a great robotics team at Foster High School. We had a environmental science team at Foster High School. I mean, there's lots of examples of you know those other kind of things that, yeah, that we need to bring out as well. Um, yeah, another thing I think is important, you know, one thing to make sure the students like what they're learning and mm -hmm. engaging them in the different way they want to learn, but it's one, it's another thing to take into account, do they have the resources to do that, even if they want to learn, because the reality is, Sometimes we can't because they have to do a lot of things. But it's that in their life, the deep learning is just is not a priority. Mm -hmm. And if you really want to get out of the box, maybe you know, in terms of how we would do more money, if we have a lot of students, for example, that are have jobs to support their families, mm -hmm. what about if we channeled some money to them so they didn't have to work mm -hmm. out of the box? <laughs> mm -hmm. That's the kind of thinking I like. Yeah, it's a, uh, yeah, Director Bullock. I, I agree. Like, I think it's this balance between like, how can you be really visionary about like, you know, and then very kind of like, what would it look like in a perfect 
threat world, if we had all the resources in the world, and then saying, okay, here's this like vision. Um, and then now what's what's reality and how can we reshift or whatever resources to really help us get there? Um, but if we don't have that vision, right, of these really kind of really big bold things, then we're just kind of chugging along in the status quo, right? Yeah, it's always easy to, to be comfortable and just yeah. go back into the status quo. Yeah. Particularly in a system like education yes. or you know government really things. Because the there's whole. more to yeah. there's more than enough stuff going on just yeah. to keep us busy with that. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately. Thank you so much That's for bringing, bringing this. Um, really insightful. All right. Uh, so that brings us to our action items um, for this evening. So we'll just kind of go one at a time. Um, uh, the first one is the approval of human resources staffing report. I moved. Okay. Um, any discussion or questions? Okay. All in favor of approval? Aye. 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 Uh, where's Jan? Sorry, Aaron. Okay, great. Aaron, Aaron is sitting there on the screen. Um, okay, um, next is approval of the collective bargaining agreements. So moved. Second. How many discussion questions, comments? I just wanted to check, uh, Ranga, this, this chart I had, the average step increase, is that two? Is that a good number for the average step increases across? Two percent? Yeah. Let me get back to you. Okay. Um, I, I just want to make sure. I, I just want to make sure. I, th I think I've seen you present numbers sometimes at about 1.9 or something. Maybe slightly. Okay. That's yeah. fine. I'll confirm that. All right. Thanks. All in favor of approving the collective bargaining agreements? Aye. Aye. All right. And then lastly, approval of the overnight travel for our student representative to attend the well of the conference. Um, any discussion or questions? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Just, can I go back to the collective by the way? No. <laughs> no, I got a yes and no. I just wanted to say thank you for doing it in a yeah. timely manner. That was all. Sorry. And for all the work, I know it was a, a, a lot. Both, yeah. Uh, okay, and then all right. So that brings us to our second opportunity for public comment. Um, if uh, you would like to offer any public comment, I don't think there's anyone in the room who's gotten up and added their name to the list. Of so that leaves anyone that um, may be online joining us that would like to give public comment. You can enter your name in the chat or raise your hand. I have to go to the participant menu to see if I'm going to Cool. All right. Seeing none, um, we will move to adjourn our meeting. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a lovely evening. Thank you.